Hello, I'm Scott Criswanis, here with Mr. Alan Barsom, Director and Partner of OCL Vision in London. Dr. Barsom, thanks for joining us. Thanks very much for having me. Tell me a little bit about yourself and the types of patients you see at your clinic. So I'm a consultant ophthalmic surgeon. I specialize in cornea, cataract, and refractive surgery. I would say half of my patients are pure refractive patients, so patients that are just seeking independence of glasses. And the other half have a variety of diseases, of which by far the most common is cataract, uh, with a smaller minority having corneal disease or, or corneal problems. Um, I probably put in over 500 lenses uh, each year as, uh, as part of the cataract surgery, and then the minority are refractive lens exchange. Tell me about the Ray-1 EMV optic and what makes it different from other IOLs. So the Ray-1 EMV optic is categorized as a monofocal lens, but I think, strictly speaking, it should be classified as an increased range of focus lens because standard monofocal lenses really just give you distance at one focal point unless there are any inherent aberrations within that patient's particular eye coming from the cornea. This lens has a small amount of positive spherical aberration built into it, and the aim of that is to increase the range of focus, to increase the amount of uh, intermediate and near vision, uh, and without compromising on the distance visual acuity and without inducing any kind of uh, visual dysphotopsia or visual disturbance. It was designed uh, originally in order to um, in order to be created with a monovision setup, um, but it can be used with an emetropic target, as I'll speak to you a little bit more about later. When you first started using the Ray-1 EMV, what monovision offset did you use between the dominant and non-dominant eye? So when I first started using the lens, I really wanted to know what the lens could achieve when there was no monovision whatsoever built into the calculation or built into the uh, lens power that we were using um, in terms of what it could achieve above a regular lens with a target of emetropia. So I targeted emetropia in both eyes for the first 30 or 40 implantations that I did with this lens. Tell me about patient selection and biometry criteria for the Ray-1 EMV. So in terms of patient selection, initially the only patients I would exclude were patients with high astigmatism just because the lens at the moment, it doesn't come in a toric um, variety. Um, so if the astigmatism was significant enough so that you would want to eliminate it with a, a toric lens, then I wouldn't use it. And if there were patients where I had a concern about decentration, um, such as pseudoexfoliation syndrome patients or patients with known zonular problems, I also would choose not to use it just because with the spherical aberration built into the lens, I'd be worried about inducing aberrations if it was to be decentered. Um, having said that, I've not seen any patients complain of problems uh, if the lens uh, hasn't centered perfectly, but these uh, Ray-1 lenses tend to always um, center where you want them. The haptics kind of find the equator of the lens and, and, and center as well, unless the patients got pre-existing pathology. The other group of patients I wouldn't implant it in are patients that have had previous radial keratotomy, because those patients have oblate corneas and very high amounts of positive spherical aberrations. So I wouldn't choose to induce any more, even though the amount built into this lens is very small. So it's really patients with zonular problems, previous radial keratotomy, uh, or moderate to high astigmatism. Otherwise, I put it in pretty much everyone. Can you tell me about patient outcomes and satisfaction with the Ray-1 EMV? Yeah, so the satisfaction levels are very high. I think the reason for that is that patients are able to maintain the same kind of distance vision and quality of vision that you'd expect with a standard monofocal but the lens gives additional intermediate and in some cases even reading vision and that is not common and in fact is very unlikely with a standard monofocal lens. Um, patients often think that it's they may want glasses just for reading for example but actually if you use a standard monofocal lens and the patient is driving and can't see the dashboard of their car or they're not able to see their phone, or they can't see their watch, or they can't see to shave or put on makeup, and they find that they can find that quite annoying. And even patients with cataracts, when they have the natural lens in their eyes still there, they have more accommodation, i.e., more ability to focus on close 
than they do sometimes afterwards with a standard monofocal lens. So there's always a consideration that you might be making patients more dependent on glasses if you just use a standard monofocal lens. And that's not the case with this lens. So it's, it's nice that patients can be reassured that they will only require glasses for um, small print reading, providing you, that's assuming you target emetropia. If you target um, mini monovision or myopia, then you can make patients totally independent of glasses. Mr. Barson, talk to me specifically about refractive outcomes and visual acuity outcomes with the Ray-1 EMV. Yeah, so I've been very impressed with the outcomes. The refractive outcomes specifically are quite interesting because the lens has small amounts of positive steric aberration. Sometimes patients will accept more myopia on their refraction postoperatively, which doesn't actually correspond so much to their level of vision. So, you know, we found some patients, you may be refracting them to minus a half, for example, but they still have six over six, 20, 20 over 20 vision or better. The, I guess the two points are, one is that you have to take the postoperative refraction in the context of what the patient's vision is, but also because the lens has an increased range of focus, it's quite forgiving of small amounts of refractive error because it will allow the patients to focus through that range. So that's been helpful. What I now do is I'll target the lowest positive number on biometry for the dominant eye and a little bit more um, myopia in the, in the non-dominant eye. In terms of the visual acuity outcomes, the visual acuity outcomes are excellent. They're, they're what you'd expect with a standard monofocal lens for distance. Um, when we look at individual eyes, we see more than 80% are 2020, 6 over 6, logmar 0, 0.0 or better. But when you look binocularly with an emetropic target, we're seeing that 100% of patients are achieving uh, those kind of outcomes. So it's very reliable in terms of its ability. And this is in eyes, obviously, without other disease that might limit vision. So not in eyes with any macular problems, but in eyes that don't have any copathology, we're seeing excellent visual outcomes for distance. And then intermediate, we're seeing the majority of patients, when it's again, when it's done binocularly, are N8 or better, which is J5 or better. Um, and then with a little bit of monovision offset or a little bit of minus target in a non-dominant eye, we can achieve higher numbers there. So 100% N8 or better, and a large, a large number of patients can achieve N6 or even N5 or better depending on how much monovision you target. The other thing we found is that it's very forgiving of astigmatism. So in general, I'm only choosing to use a toric lens if the patient has 1.25 diopters of against the rule of astigmatism um, or 1.5 diopters of with the rule of astigmatism on the cornea. Uh, for anything less than that, I sometimes use an opposite opposite limbal relaxing incision. Small amounts of astigmatism like 0.75 diopters don't seem to be a problem. Again, presumably due to the increased range of focus, the lens is forgiving of those amounts of astigmatism. Tell me about your experience with monovision as it relates to the Ray-1 EMV. So once I was comfortable with how the lens was working with an emetropic target, I wanted to see what could be achieved with greater amounts of monovision. In patients that were already tolerating monovision in their contact lenses, I would target full monovision, albeit with this lens, I don't feel that large amounts of uh, monovision are required because it gives you an extra approximately one to one and a half diopters of increased range of focus. I would target approximately minus 1.25 to maximum minus 1.50 in the non-dominant eye in patients that, want, that wanted total independence of glasses and were previously happy in monovision contact lenses. But for the majority of patients where they don't particularly demand spectacle independence, but we're just trying to give them something extra, if you like. I would target Plano in the dominant eye and approximately minus 0.37 in the, in the non-dominant eye. So between minus 0.25 and minus 0.5 uh, in the non-dominant eye. And then there are a few patients that fall in between those two where you want to give them a little bit more, but you don't want to give them the full amount. But I quite like small amounts of monovision. You get the extra one to one and a half diopters of increased range of focus from the lens. Um, they really are. They, they really do come out independent of glasses for everything except for small print reading. And even then, it's their choice, really, whether they want to put the glasses on then, because it may only be when they're doing it for a long amount of time, like if they're looking at a document or reading a book. But otherwise, they walk around really without needing the glasses. And it doesn't come with it doesn't come with any of the baggage that, you know, full presbyopia correcting lenses like trifocal lenses come with. So you don't need chair time before you don't need chair time afterwards. So in a busy practice like mine, it's great. 
What advice can you give to surgeons who want to expand their premium IOL offerings? I think that this lens really hits a sweet spot for those kind of pe- those kind of surgeons. There are a variety of reasons why, why they may not be offering premium lenses or using premium lenses. They might be worried about managing patient expectations before or afterwards. They might be worried about patient selection criteria. They might be worried about the price being prohibitive, uh, or they might be worried about there being some kind of requirement on technical expertise on their part with respect to using uh, these lenses or what kind of diagnostics might be required before. With this lens, I think really almost all of that pretty much goes out the window. So you, you could select patients using only biometry. I, even if you didn't have topographic data available, you're not going to be putting patients at risk by using this lens. I think a lot of the exclusion criteria that people worry about with presbyopia correcting lenses don't apply with this particular lens. I don't think you need to promise a lot to the patients um, because it's not they're not the kind of patient that's coming wanting a trifocal lens, for example. So you can really it really does allow you to under promise and over deliver. And it really is it really is the kind of lens that someone who isn't using premium lenses but thinks, you know, I wonder what it would be like to have a premium lens offering in my practice um, should jump on board and, and get going with. I think they'd be very happy. Where does the Ray One EMV fit within your surgical offerings? In my surgical offerings, I will evaluate what the patient's requirements are for glasses and what their expectations are, what their desire is with respect to um, what they want to be afterwards in terms of glasses dependence or independence. For patients that require total independence of glasses, I will use the trifocal normally the Ray-1 trifocal intraocular lens. However, there are many exclusion criteria for use of that lens. For example, patients with recalcitrant uh, or moderately severe ocular surface disease, patients with macular pathology, um, patients who, and maybe even in some patients who do professional night driving, for example. Um, and that is not the case with and patients with irregular uh, corneas. So patients that have had previous refractive surgery, maybe um, keratoconus, for example, and, and, and those patients don't need to be excluded from using the, the Ray-1 EMV. So I now actually offer it to everyone who doesn't require either or, or, or want or need either a trifocal lens or a, um, or a toric or a toric lens, which kind of goes in, goes along with the criteria we spoke about before about patients I would exclude. So the most the lens that I most commonly put in now is the Ray One EMV because um, many patients are happy to wear glasses for small print reading, and and they or they may fulfil the exclusion criteria for a trifocal lens. So I may use a trifocal lens in about a quarter to maximum forty percent of my intraocular lens patients, um, but the vast majority of the remaining patients are having either the Ray One EMV or a, a toric lens and it's it's pretty unusual for a patient to just elect to have a standard monofocal lens because the additional price that they need to pay for this lens is relatively small compared to all of the additional gains that they get in terms of spectacle independence in those intermediate and some near tasks. So it sounds like you plan to adopt the Ray-1 EMV as a long-term option for your patients? Unless something better comes along. I mean it, it's bec- it has become my go-to lens I had a few patients even where they have quite a lot of astigmatism in one eye and not the other. So I may use a toric lens in one eye and then the Ray-1 EMV in the other. So I kind of use the Ray-1, the Ray-1 EMV wherever I can use it because I feel really comforted and reassured by the fact that they're very likely to have unaided intermediate vision as well as unaid, unaided distance vision. When you're discussing surgical options with patients, how do you sell them on the value of the Ray-1 EMV? Yeah, it's, it's incredibly easy. So you know, I speak to them about some of the things that we've, we've already discussed. I'll say to them, look, if, we, if you have a standard lens, I, first of all, I always tell them it's fine to have a standard lens. If they're having cataract surgery, they'll still feel like they're better off. But with a standard lens, the only times when they wouldn't need glasses m- most likely would just be for things like driving or watching television. The problem comes in that we live in a very intermediate slash near dominated world now that we never used to do before. And I think many surgeons forget the pace of the world has moved on so much. So although someone might be watching television, likely they have their phone in their pocket or right next to them. They might want to check messages at the same time. And if you just have a standard distance monofocal lens, the reality is in today's world, you're likely to be quite highly dependent on glasses. And patients like the idea of being relatively independent of glasses. So even if they like wearing glasses and they're happy to wear glasses, the the opportunity to not wear them at essentially no additional risk is appealing to patients. 
So I just say to them, look, you can have a standard lens, but with this lens, your distance vision will be just as good, but you will also be able to see your phone, the dashboard of your car, um, most likely the menu in a restaurant, and you'll just put glasses on for small print reading. And then I say to them, if you want to wear glasses all the time, because some of them worry about having to put glasses on for small print reading, they can wear them. But if they're going out on a rainy day or they're playing sport or they forget their glasses, or they're getting up in the middle of the night to go to the toilet, they want to know what time it is. For all of those things, they're going to have that kind of distance and intermediate vision, which makes them feel relatively independent of glasses, which is something, something most people want. So it's, um, it's not something that we've had any, any objection to because it's just it's, a, it's an additional benefit for a relatively small price. Mr. Barsom, thanks for sharing your experience with the Ray One EMV. Thank you.